Where am I? You don't know where you are? No. You're in Bulgaria. <sighs> Hello and welcome back to part two of my Bulgar to China mega campaign series. And we're going to be having a pretty eventful video ahead, so let's jump right in where we left off with Queen Luzian, starting her illustrious reign as Queen of Great Bulgar. The first and most important thing I do when starting up the game is to immediately increase relations with possible ally countries, which seems like a totally normal and not hard thing to do, but holy hell, you'd be mistaken. And just by looking at my country compared to others, you'd be right in thinking that maybe we're a tad bit too small. But I'll look. Then, for a painstakingly long 17 years, thankfully, EU4 makes it easier to get claims, so once my troops were fully organized, I marched across Quing Tang and reunited my lands to what they kinda were before the CK3 transfer. Now comes the most daunting task that I feared of doing ever since I've even thinking of this mega campaign, and that is taming the Ming Empire. Of course, the burning question is how I'm supposed to fight the uncontestedly strongest nation in the world at this point. And the answer is to wait till the perfect moment to strike. At some point, I noticed at least two revolts occurring in southern China. To me, this is the best distraction I was probably going to get, so I sealed the fate of my economy for the next 50 years and bought four mercenaries. So on April 24th, 1448, we declared war on the Ming Empire and immediately started flooding into the country. Our first objective is to siege down the mountainous fort at Daitong as it's the first and only line of defense against my armies from taking the Forbidden City in Beijing. On January 29th of the following year, Daitong would fall in good time, but knowing that I would need to lift two sieges in my own land before continuing, I turned my Maj Podge army around and attack an isolated 18,000 strong Ming army, and then once again on the main Ming army of 21,000 besieging my capital before reinforcements could arrive. After my stunning victories, I get word that the Ming issued an imperial decree, and while its effects are completely separate from this war, this brought their mandate down to 23, meaning a plethora of debuffs were now active. With the Canton rebels still holding a castle in the south, my strategy of occupying the Forbidden City is still very much an obtainable goal, so the siege of Beijing starts in earnest on the 19th of September. As time marched forwards into the next year, Ming troops appeared in droves from the south, immediately swinging the momentum of the war back into their favor. Although if it wasn't clear that Great Bulgar was meant to usurp the Mandate of Heaven, with just a 14% chance we finally captured Beijing after 267 days, fulfilling my main goals of the war, meaning that all I had to do now was waste away time while the Ming sinks deeper and deeper into a hole of my creation, one impossible for them to climb out of. Seeing my opportunity, I launched a do-or-die offensive against the ongoing Ming siege to retake Daitong, barely defeating them before much larger armies could interfere. Now resting in the relative safety of my own land, I attempt to regain my manpower in order to extend the war as long as possible. However, with any war, it is about whoever makes the least amount of mistakes. So once I saw an 11,000 Ming army attack Beijing without a general, I rallied my army together and prepared to relieve the siege. But just before I attacked, a 23,000 strong army appeared from the south, along with a 25,000 and an 18,000 cutting off my escape by entering Daitong. This was a very cunning move considering the Ming military strategy has been dubious at best so far in the war. Rather ironically though, the only thing preventing my army from total destruction is the forts at Daitong and Beijing, as they form a small pocket where they can't reach me. Realizing that I can no longer continue the war else I risk losing my entire army, I settled for two insignificant provinces along with 2,675 ducats and 10% of the Ming economy for the next 10 years. Besides economic issues, Issues for the time being, what would follow would be years of the Great Bulgar Kingdom barely holding itself together by the skin of its teeth. Ming on the other hand would hit zero mandate early on, and the feeling that it's on its last legs is palpable as they get free claims on them along with their tributary states abandoning their obligations to the Celestial Empire. Ten years after the end of the First War, I attacked the Ming once again in 1461 as they were still managing to defeat its rebellions, and even though I'm not stable internally yet, I attacked to finish off what I started. Unfortunately, there's gonna be no fancy map animations because this war was a lot simpler than the first one because rebellions in the south preoccupied them and then I just swept past Daitong and Beijing with zero resistance, besides their garrisons of course. And with no contests in my pious invasion, I tear through the unfortified Chinese coast till eventually I peace out, making sure to take the evidently strategic positions of Daitong and Beijing into my burgeoning kingdom. 
but now I had to face a recovery period like never before. Rebellions, scarce manpower, loans, corruption, and inflation would rack the nation to its core like never before, along with the estates being a major hindrance to my struggle for the return to normalcy. I'd also like to note the death of Queen Louis Zhen, the last of the true migratory-minded monarchs, which would ring in the more Chinese-centric rulers, starting with the promising Azep I. While I licked my self-imposed wounds, the first of the two nations to break away from the Ming sprang up. Then, that opened the floodgate as more and more rebellions turned up successful, along with myself and the Mongols carving a piece out of the power vacuum till the Ming fled to Taiwan. I'll now talk about the biggest self-sabotage I've ever made in a mega campaign. I went Nestorianism. First off, I can't marry any other country as Nestorian is Christian and therefore can't marry without. Next is that while they have an interesting religion mechanic, I can't even see most of the holy sites and besides the one that I do own, I won't be getting any of the rest as they are either too far away or I don't want my war with Persia to look like this, I want it to look like this. But I can deal with those, I can explain them away with fluff and RP, although despite CK3 clearly showing Nestorianism as the Eastern Christianity sect, you cannot become the Emperor of China with it in EU4. Apparently, only select few religions can become the Emperor. At some point, I even tried to cheat myself into it, but that failed as well, so now you know why I never become the Emperor in this playthrough. Five years later and things are still teetering on the brink of collapse, but fearing that I'm going to be outscaled by either Persia, Mongolia, or the newly unified Japan, I prepare to expand but I'm stuck flabbergasted by Persia, who for no good reason decided to warn me. Rather ballsy, I would call their bluff and go to war with Liang anyways, allowing me to not only expand, but also to keep Persia out of the whole Chinese political fandangle. Soon after, I was recovering from a particularly bad string of revolts, then Ning, the largest of the Ming successor states, declared war on me. And it's moments like this where it may look bad, but with a few simple clicks from the Loan tab to the Mercenaries tab, I magically expanded my borders. Though, the repercussions would follow me for a long while, as I had to wait a pretty good amount of time before the political situation would calm itself enough for me to fulfill what is becoming a tradition at this point, and attack the meager remnants of the Ming Empire for another easy bit of land. Years later, I see that Mongolia is being attacked by Persia, who is expanding very, very fast. Luckily for me, I'm in a regency so I can't go to war to capitalize on this. Nonetheless, when my new king took the throne, I immediately declared war on Mongolia, However, annoyingly, so did Manchuria at nearly the same time. So Great Bulgar and Manchuria would race across the Mongolian steppe to occupy as much land as possible to deprive the others of war score and possible territory from the peace deal, but once the action drew close to Persia, they decided to join in the war as well against Mongolia. Despite the peace deal being underwhelming, with only poorly developed Mongolian land and a small Tibetan vassal being taken, this war would have long-term payoffs in other ways. First, I could not expand or else my religion would only further sink into becoming a minority in my own country. Second, if I don't get strong allies, I run the risk of being attacked and taken apart by meddling powers in the region. Third and most importantly, it gave me the idea to expand by not taking land for myself, but instead to do vassal feeding which means I'll give land to my vassals for them to core, and then once I integrate them I won't have to pay for that cost. So we'll begin my next series of conquests, and the second nation to fall under my vassalage would be the former aggressors Ning, who fell out of relevancy following my victory over them. And once my former tributaries truce expired, I went to war of Lian Steng and crushed their allies allowing me to double Dej's land easily. Then I attacked Ganjo, who was a tributary of the dominant power in the region Karachis. And while I wouldn't be able to take everything from this war that I had wanted, a pretty good portion of the Tibetan plateau was now under my control. With expansions to my northern and southern fronts, I now eye down the other Chinese nations, but I had to be careful with what I do as Korea has allied with many of the Ming's successor states. The one nation they are not allied to is Miao, but they are in turn protected by Min and Liang, meaning that most of China seems to be united against Nestorianism and my Bulgar roots. Now with the stages set for is easily the most important war since it brought down the Ming Empire. If I win, my eventual complete conquest of China is all but secured. But, if I fail or if the war goes on for too long, my country might implode from its unstable interior. So I declare war on Miao, but my first target in the war is actually Liang because their capital is very exposed allowing me to quickly siege it along with the surrounding area. While I was continuing my push down the coast, a Liang army 23,000 strong reappeared from besieging Ning, as I was about to take another strategic fort at Zhu Hao, and they tried to attack but I would intersect them with a 21,000 strong Great Bulgar army supported by 9,000 Dej troops, 
leading to a decisive victory that would play a major part in Liang's exit from the war. Following that, I rallied my armies and attacked the current holder of the Mandate of Evan Min by going through Ning, which would work wonderfully as they decided that occupying my vassal's land was a better strategy than defending against me, which would lead to me piecing them out and taking their land in the north of China, expanding my influence in the area massively, and soon after Miao would be pieced out as well for a good amount of land. The lesson in the war is clear. Without a strong and centralized Korean kingdom to lead them, a disunited China could never effectively work together, which is something Korea must have realized as they would ally with Miao, meaning that a direct confrontation with Korea is now inevitable. Emboldened by big victory, I invade Cochin, who was left unprotected as Manchuria lost a war against Korea, and then a few years later, Japan also defeated them, and released Chatar, giving me another easy avenue to expand my borders with basically no contest. Along with that, my religious conversion attempts are paying off, as seemingly most of the land conquered in China has been converted, meaning that unrest not only in those specific provinces, but nationwide, is improving. Often with winning a war, unintended consequences might pop up. Unsettlingly, Divet, a regional power in Indochina along with Liang, split up the now-shamed Chinese Empire of Min. But now I fear that with Divet owning land in China, other foreigners might greedily eye the Middle Kingdom. This made me nervous about the many different and strong nations to my south, so I set out to secure the Chinese border so no further encroachment in the heavenly land could be made. First on the national security campaign would be Gonzo, and from that war I would conquer all the land that I had wanted in the first Tibetan conquest war. Next I would eye up Manchuria, a country that I at one point believed would rival me for dominance in China, but calling them a disappointment would be understating the facts of their decline. Unceremoniously, I declared war on Manchu and took what land interested me. Importantly, this war marked how far north I was willing to take my borders, allowing me to focus on the south. Over time, I would integrate Dej into my kingdom, opening a border with Dali, an unremarkable Ming successor state that has done little in this campaign so far. The war would be a simple matter as they would quickly be overrun, and all that prevented me from winning was the multitude of small allies I had, which inevitably fell in good time. Still without a strong ally, I would seek a mutually beneficial alliance, and my ally of choice would easily be Japan. Japan is the perfect ally for my country. They don't have ambitions for conquering China just yet, and they have an imposing navy whereas I have little to none. Now with a strong ally to make sure I won't be declared war on, I set out to attack the small nation of Naima, which is allied to the more important target of Punjab, who will be a really difficult country to take down. Punjab quickly showed itself to be a different animal to the disunited and fractured nations that I had grown accustomed to attacking, as they flexed their confidence by striking first in the war, and even though they lost, it sent a clear message that peace would be written in blood. As at the war's conclusion, over 350,000 men would die, with more than half of them coming from my country alone, only for a meager amount of land to be taken. So while I waited for my manpower to recover, I noticed that Ning allied itself to Divet, along with its independence being guaranteed by Liang, the newest holder of the Mandate of Heaven. Once I gathered my armies on the border, Liang, being the cowards they are, refused to honor their agreement and enter the war. Nevertheless, I attacked them to finish off my goal of securing what I viewed as China's borderlands. Using my advantage of having overwhelming numbers, I flooded into Divet unopposed, dominating them enough to take the most southern parts of China, giving a clear message to the world that the unification of China is all but set in stone. I wouldn't say something like that if I didn't have a reason to believe so, cause once I regained my manpower, for the first time I entered the great powers list. Being a great power, I need to move my capital to a place where I can project my power and show off my kingdom's greatness. The obvious choice is Beijing, the old capital of the last united Chinese empire, and home of the Forbidden City. To make it my capital would be my unofficial claimant to the Mandate of Heaven. So I'll move the capital of the kingdom to Beijing just before I would prepare to attack the small kingdom of Yan, which now borders my capital in what I would call a power move. Yan is allied to Korea and its de facto puppet of Min, who now only owns a single trade port in the south of China and is of little threat to me. So on November 30th, 1678, I would start the most important war in the campaign to unify China. One that gets its moniker as if I win, I could force Korea out of Chinese politics for the time being with the support of my Japanese allies. The early stages of the war have already been thought out to tedium by the best military minds in Great Bulgar, so I march into Yan with full force to ensure a quick occupation all the while a series of brand new forts at Xinjiang, Chitar, and Beijing would slow down the Korean army's advance. 
However, at the christening of the Year of Our Lord 1680, the Sino-Japanese fleet would be crushed off of the coast of Korea, seriously damaging Japan's effectiveness in the war as alternate routes to bring land support would be needed to ensure safe passage. Along with that, while my army was still besieging Huan, the Korean army masterfully took Shenyang in short time, exposing the superiority of Korean leadership, along with spreading doubts about the capability of the forts that I had placed so much faith in. So once I finished the siege, I attacked the Korean army besieging Tatar, which I knew I could not let fall or else Beijing would be under serious threat from attack and I could not lose this war. Instead of retaking Shenyang, I split up my forces. Two armies would head to the old capital to defend it from a small Korean offensive in the region. The other would head south to retake the coast from a small Min force, blocking landings from Japanese transports. In both actions, no battles would take place, as the Koreans reinforced their attack, meaning I could no longer realistically attack them without more troops, along with Min quickly exiting the war as 60,000 Japanese troops arrived and headed towards the increasingly dire situation in the north. A few months later, using the absence of my forces in the north, Korea would take Chitar while I moved my 1st and 2nd army out of Beijing and into the mountainous region in the old Daetong Fort, which is nothing more than a relic of the old Ming Wars, forced back in the relevancy for a war it's unholy suited for. Luckily in the nick of time, Ji Qing would be retaken as the 3rd army along with 60,000 Japanese in tow would lead the assault to retake Chitar. Embroiled by my confidence as the now clearly outmanned Koreans fled the area as I re-entered Beijing before they would take it. Knowing that show of force did not deter the Koreans for long, I waited for another offensive which was sure to come in the form of an additional 70,000 Koreans coming down from their victory against Japan in northern Manchuria. They would attack us in Chitar, but in what is becoming a common issue for the Koreans, rivalry between generals will cause the attack to fail, and if Korea sent its over 100,000 reinforcements in the area, we would have undoubtedly seen a more deadly battle. Directly after, Persia declared war on Japan and defeated the 60,000 men I had as support, and soon after, Japan would exit the war to defend against Persia, leaving me in a very precarious position. This caused me to throw caution to the wind and attack a 50,000 stack attacking Beijing, while my third army retake Chitar. And, with total success on all accounts, I can now officially say that I halted Korea's best chance at defeating me. But due to wasting precious resources in southern China for little gain, along with the sheer toll of deaths from battle, bled my reserves completely dry. Despite my disdain towards hiring mercenaries as I now viewed my army as a more professional one, I would be forced to hire two mercenary companies, sharing a total of 60,000 together to invade Korea proper. Then during March 1685, I began my counteroffensive to retake Shenyang from enemy hands which would catch the Koreans by surprise as they managed to catch a 36,000 army before they could escape. And after a years long siege, for the first time my armies marched into Korean land, besieging two border forts. In spite of this, Korea would conduct one last all out offensive before calling it quits. They would send a small poultry force and no more than 6,000 men to Guangzhou, and with me thinking nothing of it, I let it go, till the Korean Navy entered the Bohai Sea and what seemed to be the entire Korean army rushed into my lands, past Sandong and into Guangzhou, where they would walk across the Bohai Sea and into Yan territory. I attempted to meet them in battle, but most of them would make it to the boats. This forced me to react by taking precious troops off of the offensive and ending one siege entirely. Owing to a very quick response time after a series of battles, the surprise attack would come up short. Although, getting too excited and overconfident, I attacked a numerically inferior Korean army and paid the price for it. Not wanting the tides of the war to change at such a pivotal point, I reinforced my battered forces with another 30,000 mercenary company. With nothing left to stop me, I advanced into Korea. This last effort, however, would come at a great cost, considering how many forts are present in the country, forcing me to siege them down. Because this war was so brutal, I had wanted more than just Korea out of Chinese politics. But after 40,000 Bulgar troops were humiliated against 13,000 Koreans at Gangyi, I had enough of this war and pieced the Koreans out for them abandoning China. Finally, in 1688, the Nine Years War concluded with just a little shy of 90,000 people dying in the conflict altogether. A solemn victory with only two provinces being brought into our lands for nearly half a million people dead. After the war, we would have less than 50,000 men in all of our armies, a far cry from our pre-war standards as that wouldn't even be enough to fully man one of our pre-war armies. 
Unlike other costly wars which I am no stranger to in this campaign, I could not wait for my manpower to recover, and so just after three years I declared war on Liang despite my forces being nowhere ready to fight. Thankfully my Japanese allies were there to support me, meaning Liao and Liang stood no chance as I just marched across the Chinese coast again. Wanting to attack again soon, I wiped peace with Miao and took all the northern Chinese land Liang held. This also allowed me to promote my kingdom title to an empire title, while also giving me a cultural union over all the Chinese minorities, so at this point I consider myself Emperor of China, even though I don't have the, you know, the mechanic. What would follow would be a series of wars against Miao and Liang as I would eat them up, formally ending the old Chinese empire, but as I said before, it was replaced with a better one. It's at this point where I started to close up my campaign for EU4 and prepare for the transfer to Vic 2. So I take the last part of China that I don't control from that vet and finally unite all of China under a single Sino-Bulgar banner. Then I came to realize, what is a Chinese empire without vassals? So I attacked that vet once again and brought them under my control. Immediately after, I saw Persia attacking Punjab, so I rushed over to take Kashmir from them before Persia could occupy it. So I, uh, I don't know how long this video is going to be, but this is the longest script that I've written in a while, so I'm sorry if the pacing is a little weird. EU4, in my opinion, is easily the hardest game to pace for mega campaigns. But to be honest, I really think that this is a really interesting scenario for me to pick up on in Vic 2. Unlike my last two campaigns, I have a clear goal for my future conquests ones that make sense as well. The rest of the world isn't that bad to be honest either. Revolutionary France popped up and it's definitely the leading power in the world by far, but Scandinavia and Danelaw, which are both ruled by the Spanky dynasty, could pose a real threat to them. Surprisingly, the Byzantines did not fare well and got raffle stomped, but to their own credit, they're still kicking. The Americas are dominated by France and Danelaw, Although, some of those colonies will probably become independent when they become great powers in Victoria too. If I had to say a religion won in this campaign, it would very, very easily be Christianity. As all of North and South America, almost all of Europe, and a good portion of the Middle East and of course China are Christian. So as I said before, that's it for EU4, and I hope you all enjoyed and would consider subscribing, as this takes a lot of effort for me to make these videos, and thank you all for spending your time watching my videos.